Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Jeremy Dennis as tonight's guest speaker. Currently, Jeremy lives and works in Southampton, New York on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. He graduated with an MFA from Pennsylvania State University in 2016 and also holds a BA in studio art from Stony Brook University. Recent solo exhibitions include Stories, Dreams, Myths, and Experiences, the Parish Art Museum's Roadshow, Stories from Where We Came, the Department of Art Gallery, Stony Brook University, Trees Also Speak, SUNY College at Old Westbury, Nothing Happened Here, Suffolk County Community College, New York, on this site, Indigenous People of Suffolk County, Suffolk County Historical Society, Riverhead, New York, Jeremy has been an artist in residence at Yaddo, Birdcliff Artist Colony, North Mountain Residency, MDOC, Storytellers Institute, Eyes on Main Street, Watermill Center, and the Vermont Studio Center. Awards include 2018 Creative Bursar Award from Getty Images, 2016 Dream Starter Grant. Jeremy uses the 21st Century Digital Toolkit to reflect upon and make visible his people's ancestral traditions. I suspect his practice is equal parts paying tribute to his roots, a journey towards self-knowledge, and the writing of historical wrongs and misconceptions. Uh, please help me welcome Jeremy Dennis to our lecture series. I'm from the Shinnecock Indian Reservation in Southampton, New York. Uh, this is a photo I took of our local community center where we have some of our tribal events and gather as a nation. There's about 800 of us that live on the reservation, as well as about 400 of us who live throughout the United States and throughout the world. And on the bottom right, you can see our uh, insignia. Uh, in this presentation today, I want to talk uh, largely about a project titled Stories. But before I get to that point, I want to talk a little bit about how I got to that series and also what's coming afterwards. Uh, back in 2008, I attended Stony Brook University uh, to study painting, drawing, printmaking, and sculpture. But I quickly realized, uh, due to my interest, that using photography would get me to the point of combining magical realism and also incorporate themes of storytelling as well, which I were, was really interested in. Uh, back before I started studying uh, darkroom photography, this is an intaglio print that I did at Stony Brook University that sort of precedes some of my Native American oral stories uh, projects. So uh, from college, I've always had an incredible uh, mentor and support throughout the entirety of my visual art practice. Uh, most notably, my relative Herbert Randall, who was involved in the Freedom Summer of the 1960s and 70s in Mississippi uh, was sort of there in the beginning and also offered to me his Minolta 35 millimeters. And you can see one of his iconic portraits on the top right during the Freedom Summer uh, protests. But along the way, I've also had encounters and learned from uh, Gary Schneider and Isaac Burbeck at Stony Brook University who were incredibly uns inspirational and Lonnie Graham and Stephen Rubin, who still teach at Penn State University. Outside of uh, personal mentorship, I've always been inspired by the big photographers. I'm sure you all know uh, Cindy Sherman, Gregory Crutston, Jeff Wall, and others. But most notably, I might want to point out uh, the work of Philip Lorca de Corsia. This is one of his uh, images from the Hustler series that I find inspiring in the way he composed portraits, used uh, off-camera lighting, and approached the subjects. Another iconic uh, series of his is titled Heads from 1999. And um, de Courcia's work, Heads, I think really inspired the way that I approach photography and how I rule out what is and is not within the realm of uh, being a subject. And uh, if I recall correctly, this is the portrait he was sued for because he didn't uh, seek the permission of the subject and he actually won the case in court, uh, which I thought was really interesting as a photographer and as a student uh, learning about photography. In my intro to photography courses, 
I use a similar approach using off-camera light triggers to uh, go out into a snowy um, university landscape and take these uh, various photos of students who are just walking along the path and not really uh, realizing there was a photographer there just experimenting with the light and how flash can capture uh, some of the different elements that you can't see with the natural eye. Uh, early into my uh, darkroom and digital photography education, one of the projects I began working on is something called Fear, in which I incorporated self-portraiture and uh, the use of off-camera lighting as continued from that snow image I showed previously. Here's one of those images. Um, I think this is Kings Park um, Psychiatric Center. Another early uh, project I've worked on um, before I sort of gained traction and had a little bit more of a sense of where my trajectory was going as an artist um, is something called Dreams. And in this work, I was essentially uh, trying to interpret some of my dreams and capture them, which I thought was very fascinating and a lot of fun to uh, work with several different of my contemporaries in my visual art college and uh, class. Uh, this is another example that I really like because of the humor that I think is funny. With the uh, seeming aimlessness in my work at that point, I began to look at art history as a source of inspiration and where to go as an artist early on. I was sort of a very practical student and before I started studying uh, visual art and studio art, I was actually computer science, so I was coming from the lens of uh, practicality and if statements and kind of yes and no equations. So during these uh, early art history courses, I began to grow an appreciation for uh, largely uh, sort of biased West uh, religious art, uh, Renaissance, for example, Northern Re Renaissance. And I kept realizing that while my admiration for these artists and their works was growing, where were perhaps the indigenous representations of uh, creation stories and origin stories? So that, that stayed in the back of my mind, but I didn't really know what to do with, with that information at that point. But I graduated from Stony Brook University in 2013 and uh, I went back to Herbert Randall, who was my mentor at that time, and I said, uh, as a shy artist, what do I take photos of? I was uh, kind of unsure, and he, he kept recommending that I go to different carnivals and events that people expect photos to be taken. So on the east end of Long Island and all throughout the New England area, we have these events called uh, powwows, and ours is uh, Labor Day weekend every year, which I encourage you all to attend if you haven't been to a powwow before. But with my uh, visual art practice and photography skills, I went to about uh, maybe two or three dozen different powwows that all featured dancers, uh, craftspeople, and uh, both in a traditional and contemporary sense. And just for kind of the use of flattery and for my own interest, I did a lot of different group portraits and mostly candid photography at that point. But I was beginning to get a sense of uh, predicting behavior and when people would gather and it would be sort of like an iconic staging of images almost. But the sad thing for me was that um, for Shinnecock, for example, the powwow was, would only happen once a year, which kind of made me sad and kind of desire to express this culture and celebration throughout the rest of the year. At that point, I had such a large collection of photographs that I began to uh, combine my myth uh, interest from art history courses and I began cutting out different dancers and their, their various poses and superimposed them digitally on different landscapes and images. Uh, this, this setting is actually in my backyard at home in Southampton. In, in the background you can see the Shinnecock Bay, named after Roger Tribe. As I began to uh, gather and research and in my own view successfully interpret these stories, I began to see the power within myth and storytelling at the same time. For me it was about 
uh, communicating with my ancestors and seeing the world as they saw it. And to me, I think that it became a combination of traditional and contemporary values. Uh, most importantly, it became a way of grounding myself in traditional homelands. I'll get into more of that later. Uh, typically, when I set out to do this project, I began to do uh, one image per story, and I, always, I would always choose a scene within that narrative that set apart Native American oral stories from the other world religions and uh, origin stories at that time that I was researching. Uh, this was really interesting because the story behind this image is explaining the origin of different bird species. Um, these two figures were escaping from what the story was describing as a magician who created this hailstorm, and uh, these birds appeared out of nowhere to protect these two people. And as the hail uh, kind of stones came down and afflicted the birds, the ones that got hit became spotted and the ones below kind of remained uniform in color, which I thought was very vivid in my imagination. Um, so eventually I became uh, almost an archivist. I, I began collecting more and more and creating sketches for these different scenes and stories. And the arrows just kind of um, is my logic in a very basic way. I would gather a, uh, gather a story, I would kind of question some of the actual uh, content in the story, uh, create a sketch of that, and then to me it wasn't really important to perfectly create the composition of the sketch. It was somewhat fulfilling to actually uh, produce an image. It kind of felt like something was going from intangible to tangible, and it's really hard to describe the satisfaction behind that. So. Again, this is another example of creating a sketch and finally uh, producing an image behind that. So he's, as you can see, there's different elements. Um, I always think that the sketches are a little bit funny looking back on them. Uh, some of the challenges behind this work actually is the ever-growing secular world and uh, skepticism, I think. But to me, mythology and spirituality is always relevant due to its explanation of ori origin stories, um, whether it's the origin of species, of humans, the environment, and how it was shaped. I think all of these things relate to each other and will always be up to debate where, where and when that happened, which is one of my inspirations for this project. I also see uh, photography as a point of connection, um, whether the people that are involved in my portraiture are volunteering and believe in me strongly enough to spend their time and volunteer their time to uh, lend their image to me is very important and essential to my work, as well as the process of being a patron and allowing the work to be produced all relates back to the idea of connection for me. Um, sometimes I would have a little bit of self-doubt when I was producing this work. And I always think back to an artist named Glenn Lagan. These are two of his different uh, pieces, I think, too. And it always goes back to how I can incorporate text when I create my work. And to me, this is sort of a very basic uh, entry point where he's taking the text and very literally using it to create an image. And to me, that kind of changed my path from going from a very literal interpretation of a scene to actually uh, using my own kind of motivations to pick and choose what I want to incorporate, if I want to change a story. Um, because these stories are sacred, you're not really supposed to um, change them in my mind. And that changed when I looked at some of the art history references. One thing that's really interesting as an artist from a federally recognized tribe is sort of the basis of um, how the two governments work. For example, the Shinnecock Indian Nation received its uh, federally recognized status in 2010, which means that the government finally recognizes that we are legitimate as a people. And that allows us to have a government-to-government -government relationship with the United States, even though we're less than 2,000 people in total. 
But as an artist, uh, I'm no longer just an American artist or a Native American artist where sometimes in my mind I'm like, there's too many photographers, there's too many artists. Where are we in the world? Um, for me, that turned into, well, I'm just one artist out of 2,000 people. I think I have a very essential role in my community, and I think that is something I always think back to and kind of like a niche when it comes to photography where you place yourself. Um, the, the opposite of that uh, benefit is just the isolation that you kind of face when you're in this very small insular community. You don't really have people besides that one mentor I mentioned, Herbert Randall, to bounce ideas off of. So the great thing about the internet is that I was able to uh, contact an artist that I really look up to named uh, Knupa Hanska Luger, seen in the image. And he's doing uh, really well at the moment. He just recently received a $50,000 grant from uh, the Modern Art uh, Design Museum in New York City. And I emailed him back in college, just kind of not really expecting a response. And he wrote back to me actually saying, uh, describing my myth series, there's no actual myths. And what I mean by that is every story created here in the Americas are honest depictions of experience. Not to be confused with truth. Truth is a dead end, but honesty leaves space for the uh, ecstatic and myth mystical. Try not to get hung up on what seems impossible. So that goes back to the idea of my own skepticism and the work I'm immer immersing myself in and kind of the directed audience that I was working with who would want to see my work and how do I explain my work and this kind of fulfilled all of those questions for me and looking back at my art career I kind of wish that I was still in academia to have dozens of people to bounce ideas off of just like that so um, one question I receive often about this uh, story series is actually did I receive these stories growing up my parents or grandparents must have told them all to me but it, also, it actually just comes from the idea of the American Indian movement uh, linking back to the 1970s. And after, uh, for our community, who are the early contact people, we've endured and somehow uh, survived 400 years of colonization, assimilation, and um, kind of transformation and loss of traditional values. And what happened in the 1970s is sort of a re resurgence of traditional values and learning. So some people would, um, from the East Coast, go to the West Coast or the mid, uh, Midwest and learn some of the uh, traditions and ceremonies that they lost during those 400 years. So for me, a lot of these retelling of stories is a way of uh, rekindling that fire of storytelling and our humanity as a people. Uh, so although the stories come from a nation, a nationwide array of different tribal uh, origins, there was always the goal for me to bring it back to the local scale. And if you're familiar with Eastern Long Island, um, between Sag Harbor and East Hampton, there's this sign that you can actually visit. Um, dedicated in 1935, it reads, uh, Whooping Boys Hollow, resting place of body of Sachem Bogatikit, when born to Montauk for burial in 1651. And what this is describing is a moment of when a group of pallbearers were bringing their leader from Shelter Island all the way to Montauk on foot, which is a 25 mile uh, distance. And that's the only description that most people get if they decide to pull over on that highway. Um, which I imagine doesn't happen very often. But for me, it became something that I could imagine very easily. It had a lot of importance. And this is my sort of interpretation of that moment in time. And again, it's using off-camera lighting and uh, self-portraiture. Um, I think there's 14 self-portraits in total, um, incorporating a little bit of performance and digital manipulation. But for me, it became something that I kind of had to do as a photographer. And once something enters my mind, 
you just kind of have to do it or else it's going to just keep bouncing back and forth in your mind and distract you all day. Um, so I have these sacred stories that you kind of preserve as much as you can if you can be practical. And then you have these local historical moments. But the third category for me within the series is kind of going into post-colonial um, dialogues and theories. This one for me was an image I created not based on a story, but a kind of a call for unity in my community. Even though we're only 1800, uh, sorry, 800 people, we still have a lot of political differences. And I was hoping that this image would kind of communicate my frustration and have a call for some sort of uh, brotherly unity in my community. A lot of people respond to this very strongly because of its um, very almost uh, perfectly uh, same composition as Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Hrashai. And for me, as an indigenous artist, I think that appropriation is something that's very logical to go to. Uh, a lot of people kind of critique the idea of um, stealing or borrowing ideas too strongly, but I think due to Native American history of cultural appropriation, it per if it's perfectly well as someone who's from a less uh, kind of economically viable community. So taking that idea of appropriation even further, back in 2015 when I was at Penn State, I created a film that was only four minutes in length uh, titled Hearthless. And in this video, I'm not going to show it in the presentation. This is a still from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest with uh, Jack Nicholson. Um, what I did was I took over a dozen images and uh, different films that feature different Native American representations, whether it was this uh, figure named Chief who was silent throughout the whole movie. And uh, for me, that kind of reinforced stereotypes. And there's other films such as Last of the Mohegan and Indian in the Cupboard that kind of reinforced those negative stereotypes. And I linked them together into something that was, uh, for me, sort of like a trickster figure that can transform and shape and uh, create a continuous narrative. And I thought it was interesting to do that because when most people think of Native Americans, they either know nothing at all or they know something through um, something in the films that they've seen. So for me, this was a way of recreating their characters and using something familiar to communicate a new idea. So I'm going to step away from the stories for a little bit to talk about a series called Behind the Dance. And in my own critique of my work, since I was working in such isolation, I thought perhaps uh, using Native Americans in a romanticized way was already what was happening throughout uh, all of history <laughs> at, at some point. So in my own response, I created this book of portraits very similar to uh, Humans of New York, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, by Brandon Stanton. But in my version, I chose to incorporate both their name and their tribal nation to reinforce the idea of um, there being such a diverse uh, mix of native uh, tribes throughout the United States. Um, one of the feedbacks I received for my story series actually was calling it an escape from reality, which I thought always stuck with me. Adding further that it idealized and romanticized the past, um, I felt that this project would actually provide something that in my own mind would fulfill the, the criticism I was giving myself. Even um, the images on their own, I felt, was very strong and could work without the text that I incorporated on each page. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but these are interviews with each of the subjects within the book. But I thought that um, as a photographer and as an artist, it almost became essential going, going back to Glenn Ligon's inspiration to incorporate text, no matter what the image is, because that always gave it a little bit of agency and a little bit of importance in my mind. 
So going back to 2016, I received the Dream Starter Grant. And this kind of steered my path in a little bit of a different direction. But what was the grant was um, essentially $10,000 to pursue whatever project you proposed. And I was very fortunate to receive that grant to pursue a photo-based um, research project. And in that project, um, sort of surrounding my own community on Eastern Long Island, I began to uh, incorporate archaeological, historical, and sacred sites. And each one of these different little icons represents a site-specific Native American instance of presence in some form. So sometimes they're places where we once existed 10,000 years uh, in the past to the present that you can visit if you uh, click the link at the bottom. And this is just an example of what each page might um, kind of incorporate and inform you about each of the sites. This is a place called Fort Korchag on North Fork of Eastern Long Island. And as you can see, it's set up very similar to the way of uh, Wikipedia, using that sort of appropriation of style. And I thought that um, in addition to listing sites based on landscapes, that it would be important to go into the subgenres. So when I began working on this project, I didn't really know what a shell midden was. And I was very fortunate last year, actually, to take this photo at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum. And what, what's so amazing about their museum is that they have this full-scale village of uh, maybe 300 casts of actual people. Um, living the traditional lifestyle of the Northeastern Woodland people. And what you're seeing in this image is a woman contributing uh, used shells into a shell midden. And these were sort of the essential ways of finding our presence from uh, ancient times to the uh, late woodland period, which was about a thousand years ago. And these were so important because each of the um, artifacts that were discarded or organic materials would be preserved within the shell midden itself. And that was a way of um, finding where people lived and worked as an anthropologist or uh, archaeologist. This is another site from the North Fork that I took recently. Um, the project has over 100 sites. And I think that in itself fulfills its goal. Um, when you ask most New Yorkers, are there any Native Americans in New York? They might say, uh, yes, the Shinnecock tribe where I'm from is one site of presence. And the other is the uh, Uncachog people of uh, Mastic, New York. But to have over 100 different places that people can look to as a place of reference for me was very fulfilling and quite an achievement. Um, this project was fortunately uh, received in uh, multiple different exhibits, including the uh, Suffolk County Community, uh, or Suffolk County Historical Society, rather, which was really interesting for me to include because uh, one of the archaeologists I worked with kind of like offhand said, why don't you exhibit this artist? And the uh, curators of that gallery just said yes immediately, and it kind of worked out in a very magical way. The project itself is kind of endless. You're, you're spanning 10,000 years of history. And this map is kind of the surface of what's left to do. So all of the red nodes represent sites I've yet to go to. And the blue and green represent what's already on the map and available to the public. So for me, it was important to make this full access and uh, kind of a free database for anyone that's interested in our history and kind of using historical knowledge to fill gaps in our representation. After working on um, such a vast and personally overwhelming project, I began wondering um, simply why wasn't this database already created or why hasn't an anthropologist or archaeologists made this map and presented it already to the public. And I began to think, 
Um, perhaps it was just the history of colonization as a topic of, of discussion that made it so off-putting. And during my time uh, in 2016, I was a Vermont Studio Center resident. Um, I was able to actually manifest that idea of historical omission into the series I titled uh, Nothing Happened Here. And the image on the right was the first image I did for this series. And um, very fortunate for me, the uh, New York State Museum actually acquired that print for their collection. And for me, it was um, thinking a lot about Kara Walker's work, how she creates these icons that are meant to represent and not represent something, sort of that um, dialogue. And for me, it was a way of simplifying Native people into this icon. I remember um, back in 2016 when I was producing this work, one of the um, models posted it on Facebook and there was a comment, those darn Native Americans are at it again. And I thought immediately <laughs> that the work was successful in its execution. Um, other times, there was uh, 40 people there at the artist residency at the same time. And um, some people would realize after the f shoot was over the significance of the, the series and the message behind it, which I thought was really interesting as well. And um, skipping to 2018 from 2016, I was very fortunate to work with the local Parish Art Museum in Southampton, New York, which is just down the road from where I uh, work and live. And this was an incredible opportunity to actually uh, exhibit my story series. For five years, I've been working on um, over 80 different images that were based on Native American oral stories. And they uh, fortunately chose eight out of the 80 to incorporate in their show. And this is an incredible banner. I have to find a home for it. It's uh, 10 by 14 feet in uh, dimensions. And the parish worked with me to produce these images at Dugal using their dye bond on aluminum process. So the works were produced in a way I've never even imagined them existing before and in a space that was so perfect for the work itself that it just became a dream opportunity. Um, so changing a little bit of the topic, but still uh, relevant to everything else, if you can believe it. I became interested in this article by Noam Chomsky about uh, the occurrence of zombie themes in popular culture and how that relates to Native American people. So if you're familiar with the um, New Jurassic World series, there's this iconic scene with um, Chris Pratt, I think his name is, and the three rafters in the cage. And I began to um, every time I went to different residencies, work with different volunteers to essentially remove these monsters, whether they're dinosaurs or zombies themselves, which are already grotesque, and simply replacing them with these indigenous figures, which I suggested were horrifying even without weapons or any blood or anything grotesque. Um, I think that this work was important to me because when you think about zombie movies, it's impractical, but it's all about something that's meant to be dead, but it's still there and it's kind of coming back to attack you, right? So this is an uh, image inspired by the movie uh, Dawn of the Dead, which takes place at a, mo at a uh, shopping mall. And I think a lot of the themes of zombie movies actually comes from the idea of um, consumption and materialism. So I thought it was very fitting as one of the um, first images I produced. And again, all of these are done using uh, self-portraiture and off-camera lighting. And this is the project I'm working on at the moment in hopes to produce new work. And uh, I'm hoping future residencies will allow me to produce uh, new work. What's the title? Oh, the title is Rise. <laughs> um, all right, I think that's my presentation. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, it's a really nice presentation. I, I'm really con interested in the map you had of Long Island and New York, that one, with all the red. Oh, bullet. all the red, sure. Yeah. Is there, can we get, is there any way we can uh, obtain information on, like, what are all those red flags in Brooklyn? Because, like, I live in Brooklyn. I'd, I'd be really interested to, to see what, what that's about. Oh, sure. And, I mean, I, I've traveled back and forth all over Long Island. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting. I also really, I really love your uh, use of historical knowledge in, in your image design. The exact location of much of these red uh, nodes are meant to be a little bit uh, secret. So this is the map that I don't show the public. But all of the knowledge behind locating those places, uh, I'd be happy to share. And maybe I'll give you a card so I can uh, send like a private link or something. But there's a lot of different um, PDFs and documents I've collected to make this map possible. So uh, I'd be happy to share that. You know, I, an extension of that question maybe, I mean, you use the model of the Wikipedia page a lot for this project. And I was wondering if you would be open to inviting other researchers as well. I mean, it seems daunting to, for you to cover all of that, all of that red. Uh, have you ever considered, you know, maybe getting the public to join in and having people explore and, and report back to you or, you know, build a general page? Um, there's been different levels of uh, interaction and involvement. And um, the actual website it's based off of is actually something called WordPress. And it was once a restaurant review uh, kind of theme and website. So some of the uh, coding behind it was actually custom made. So I think that there's some areas where people can get involved and uh, kind of upload new information. And then there's other areas where it's a little bit muddy, <laughs> just trying to like figure out the whole system. Like I've stepped away from the project for a few months and I'm still trying to get back into <laughs> like how everything works and how to incorporate new knowledge. So it is all about um, just maintaining that interaction with the project itself. Mm -hmm. I think once people start giving me new uh, resources and objects and things like that, that's where involvement really kind of shines. Okay. Um, we have a lot of students here, and uh, you seem to be some something of an expert at, you know, not only applying for artist residency but you know, uh, having incredible success getting them. And it, it also seems to be a really important part of your practice as an artist. So I was wondering if you could, you know, maybe talk about that, why it's so fruitful to you, why it's so important, and, and how do you make a successful application? Mm. Um, well, there's so much to say just because I love artist residency so much. Um, maybe from where I'm coming from as an individual, I come from this very uh, low income uh, community and neighborhood. So for me, artist residencies are a way of um, getting space to work in. Um, usually the ones I pursue are um, financially backed. So you have a small stipend and they al also uh, oftentimes offer a living space, which is really perfect. So you have all these different elements that kind of take you from whatever situation you're in at one point. And um, for a month or more, sometimes it's only two weeks, you're able to just focus on whatever you propose in the proposal for that residency. So early on, um, I think one of my earliest residencies was a water mill center, which was only two weeks long. But during that time, I was actually able to produce a hardcover book that I self-produced and published just because of the um, generosity that they offered. Um, the Water Mill Center, uh, sorry, the Vermont Studio Center that you're seeing on screen, uh, 40 other artists are somehow there at the same time. They have their own studios. Some of them are painters, writers. Um, they have staff there that are all artists as well. So I think that um, in my personal work, 
being able to have access to places like this is essential. And sometimes I always feel guilty when I'm at home because um, I know that I do have time and space that's a little bit more modest, but I really seek these out because you only have a month to produce something. And typically you only go to these things once to produce something. And it's, it's always an honor for me to attend. And I find that those two things motivate me to produce the work that uh, I showed you today. And it's always been kind of that positive experience. Um, but I always tell people that um, if you ever are declined, always just keep reapplying because sometimes it's the jurors who are saying, well, I like this one artist over the other, but that's so subjective. How do you kind of define and uh, limit that? Other times it's just filling in your form before the end of the deadline where they cut off people arbitrarily. Um, sometimes I am guilty of it myself. I don't kind of fulfill the requirements of the application. They never even tell you that you didn't do it. And then you kind of feel like, oh, I got a decline letter. I don't know what happened. So I, I, don't, I don't really see a decline as a limiting point. I just apply every single time I can. And when I get successful in uh, applying, I'm just happy to have that letter. About that real quick, do you have to know what you are applying for? In, do you need a specific project or can it be more open-ended? Um, I usually try to find uh, artist residencies that are more um, communal. And I always ask my fellow artists, what did they apply with or what are they going to work on immediately when I get there? And surprisingly, a lot of the times they kind of go for that open schedule. So you don't have to have like this timeline of a whole year or even one month where you know every day what you're going to be working on. It's just a moment where you can either get away from a project that you're working on. Say you're like a studio assistant and you're just working and working, working every day. You can actually go to the artist residency and maybe read a book or you just write poetry or anything you want to do. Um, for me, it's kind of the opposite where I don't have the resources or space to produce anything. So I go there to actually make everything that I have. Um, this image on the screen is the uh, Eyes on Main Street in North Carolina. And this is um, just a volunteer I met on the street. And back in Southampton, it's kind of this luxurious and high patrolled and everyone's so orderly that you're not able to kind of produce the work that I'm trying to produce, which is a little bit of kind of like a guerrilla style of setup. question I had for you was around, uh, I, I like that you had a background in printmaking and, and uh, as part of your education. How, if you can talk a little bit about how your process of print, printmaking um, has influenced how the work you're making continue to make now, and even this ex exhibition like you're showing here that looks amazing, like what that process of was like maybe collaborating with De Gaulle and producing the, that work and how it technically ended up? Uh, I think my early education in printmaking and drawing and painting kind of paved the way for my post-production in photography. Mm -hmm. So this is a great image to talk about because you're dealing with um, one dancer who's uh, dancing at night with a spotlight, which explains these very harsh shadows and highlights. And then you have this other dancer who wasn't there at that same day. He's just kind of dancing on an overcast day. So as a painter and drawer, you kind of know that there's going to be a spotlight for the sun. And you know that the colors need to all match each other. You can very easily tell um, where you're making mistakes and where things are working. Whereas if you only have a photo background, you're kind of like, oh, that looks fine, or that looks amazing because yeah, it's happening. So, <laughs> but, and I'll I'll skip to the Dugal image. Um, I never actually saw a Dugal uh, kind of aluminum print before this exhibit, so it was a lot of learning for me, um, seeing what was possible, what was um, possible in budgeting and material, and there's actually uh, six of these, but I learned later on when one of them that were damaged, that it kind of takes them a couple of tries to actually produce one that's um, finalized because they have this entire room that's dedicated just for this process. 
there's kind of like knockoff styles where you can get this for a, a lot cheaper, but the clarity and sharpness and color is so unique to their style that you kind of uh, get what you pay for in that sense. So it was, it was just learning about um, going from paper production to aluminum prints. It's really interesting. I have another question for you, and it's something that is actually really fascinating to me. Um, because you're a young artist in a community that you described as being the one artist in the... Um, it, did you mean that as a contemporary artist, or do you, how do you relate to, let's say, the craft people in the community, and how do they see you, especially the young people? Do you inspire other young people to reach for the arts as a, as a platform and for self-expression? I'm just curious how your own community sees you. Um, so I'm one artist out of 800 tribal members and citizens. But I would say there's about uh, one or two dozen contemporary artists who practice still. And some of them are painters and craftspeople and performers and singers. And I think we all have an essential role to play. And um, maybe one unfortunate thing is the idea of collaboration isn't quite as strong where I'm from. And um, I think because of that idea that I described earlier that you have this potential to be this like one ambassador as an artist for your community. I think sometimes even myself, I, I try to say how incredible that is. And I'm like the one artist who made it, or maybe I'm doing well at some point and other people are doing well at other points. It kind of becomes a way of uh, being competitive in that sense. So I think that um, there's a lot of artists that need to be highlighted more and need to kind of work together more and I think that's where the future of the uh, little community that we have is going is that collaboration. I really like the bow and arrow <coughs> images and could you just explain a little bit more about those and if that's um, a finished series and um, just yeah kind of extrapolate on that a little bit. Oh absolutely. Um, again these are from a series titled uh, Nothing Happened Here and these were taken largely in 2016 right out of grad school at the Vermont Studio Center and everyone that's uh, participating in this project is also either a creative writer or a painter or photographer of some sorts and every arrow potentially represents sort of this gravity or burden of indigenous or Native American history in my mind so sometimes people are unaware of this presence that the arrow is supposed to represent. And for me, this kind of became an outlet, outlet for essentially what was historical omission. So sometimes people would be brushing their teeth and think, um, what a nice house I have. I wonder what was here before I was here. Some people would be enjoying nature, for example, and be wondering, or maybe have an epiphany of what was once there. And I think it relates directly to the project of Native American history and that landscape-based entry of perhaps people have thought of this before me or thought of producing that work before me, but what would happen to one's mind after that kind of battle between um, what's here now versus what was once here. Um, so for me, it became something very psychological, turned into an image. Uh, I hope that <laughs> answers the question. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Oh, thank you.